Hello, hello. Hello, Josh. Nice to see you. How are you? <laughs> I am good. It's fun to see that picture. Yeah, it's one of my favorites, actually. I love it. I love the moments we shared in Newcastle together. It seems like a very long time ago. Uh, I know it's not that long ago, but everything before the COVID. pandemic seems like a different, a different era. <laughs> I was thinking the same, actually. I was just thinking about the same thing. It was before COVID, actually a month or two before COVID, and life was so much different. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we weren't scared to hug each other. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I think, um, it's actually a really profound uh, pain, I think, for us as human beings right now. And I remember earlier in the pandemic, you know, that sense of people uh, feeling just like, I can't hug my mother. Uh, I can't shake hands. I can't, you know put my put my hand on somebody's shoulder and i think it's a reminder of how important it is for us to connect with each other yeah exactly joshua thank you so much for being part of our third national conference uh, about social emotional learning it's it's huge support you're doing for me and for bulgarian uh, community sort of emotional learning community. You know, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for what you're doing and thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Thanks to all of the people that are here with us now. We are streaming live and I know that a lot of people are, are watching and listening because they were all very interested about our meeting tonight it's tonight in bulgaria <laughs> it's a day there <laughs> i see but it's tonight here <laughs> and um, joshua i really want to introduce you because um i know you don't love to to talk about yourself but i'm gonna do it for you <laughs> I, i i really want it i i need it I need it. I'll cover my ears. <laughs> <laughs> don't blush. Just don't blush. Uh, as a matter of fact, our audience already knows you a lot because I've shared so many things about you, so much information about you. But still, I need this now, tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joshua Friedman, a co-founder and a CEO of Six Seconds. You've heard about Six Seconds so many times. This is the global community of emotional intelligence practitioners, researchers, and experts working toward a billion people practicing EQ. He is a master certified coach and leader of the International EQ Coach Certification and instructor for Columbia Teachers College Summer Principals Academy and teaches professionals all around the world practical tools to measure and create value with emotional intelligence. Joshua's international best-selling book, At the Heart of Leadership, is one of five, including wholehearted parenting, which is my favorite. He leads two ongoing research projects the Workplace Vitality Report, and the State of the Heart, which is the world's largest study of EQ. And the Bulgarian audience has actually seen data from it in the EQ cafes. He is a co-author of the Pop-Up Festival in partnership with UNICEF World Children's Day, which is a free play-based play -based curriculum introducing social emotional learning to 1.5 million children and adults. Josh also appears regularly on youtube.com six seconds, sharing insights 
on how to gain value from emotions. Never skipped to be pride, proud of the fact that I'm part of this emotional intelligence network. It has given me and Bulgarian community priceless experiences, Joshua. We first began with being part of the pop-up festival and thanks to it, parents and teachers realized not only how important is emotional intelligence, but how big is actually the effect of developing it regularly on working on developing it. Over 7,000 children and their teachers and parents took part in the initiatives already in Bulgaria, in Bulgaria. And uh, yeah, in spite of the serious situation here in Bulgaria, I don't know if you know, but it's really dark here now um, because of the COVID pandemia. Even this year, teachers and parents are asking me how they can participate in personal. They want to do it in personal. It's a huge impact you do with this pop-up festival. Give my thanks to Patty Friedman, your beautiful wife. Patty <laughs> asked me to say hello to you. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I've read about the professional Joshua. I've read his books, his articles. I've watched his videos. Bulgarian audience did too <laughs> on the EQ cafes. But um, to know Joshua personally is one of the most significant things that had ever happened in my life. Really. Thank you. I've, I've sit next to Joshua and I've seen the tears falling from his eyes while sharing very personal stories during the EQ practitioner course. Mm, just to give an example, about one of the competencies in six seconds model. Uh, he, he, he has so many stories to share and, and they're all so touching. And I know that his heart is bigger than his chest and <laughs> stronger than he thinks. <laughs> and um, I'm really happy that Joshua is my guest today because I cannot think of anyone else internationally so deeply inspired of being a parent. <laughs> yeah, and, and now I have a 20 year old and a 22 year old who are really teaching me some new things about parenting. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Learning new stuff from them now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Joshua. Why is parenting so important for growing our own emotional intelligence? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think for me, uh, of everything that I've done in my life, um, nothing has felt as important to me as being a parent. And I think sometimes, um, when we care more, it's in some ways more difficult. The emotions become deeper and more complex. Um, and I don't know, one of my, one of my friends told me um, when, when she and her, her husband first had a baby, her husband turned to her and said, I'm never going to be unafraid again. <laughs> you know, it's like, like this sense that like, there's this person out there in the world who uh, is so important. Um, and I think the struggle of trying to figure out how to be a better person, how to be a person who deserves the title, you know, like of all of my titles, teacher, coach, CEO, founder, author, the title that um, 
has the most meaning to me is daddy. And that means I need to be a person who's worthy of that title. And that means I need to, to grow and be better. And Paulina, I, I, I mean, I look back at times when my kids were three, four, five, six years old, and sometimes I feel sad and sometimes I feel ashamed that I wasn't a better parent. Um, and I don't want people to think like, oh, Josh has it all figured out. I mean, you know, from reading um, my wholehearted parenting book, I start the book by saying, I don't even know how to parent my own children. I can't tell you how to parent yours. <laughs> like, um, but there are things, you know, and I remember a couple of years ago saying to my older child, like, I'm afraid I did things wrong. And, um, and M said to me, you know, I, I feel safe with you. I know, you know, yeah, sure, you made mistakes, but I feel safe with you. And that was like this incredible uh, relief. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling, but I'll tell you one more little thing. M has been in New Zealand for the last two years. And if you had told me two years ago, you're not going to see your your baby for two years, I would have said, no, that's impossible. And um, they just got on a plane. Uh, a few minutes ago to come back to the U.S. So I'm feeling a lot of big feelings thinking about this moment in time as a parent. Joshua, that's great. Yeah. That's great. You're going to see them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing this with us. If you're making me cry on the first question... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it <laughs> until the end, really. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, Joshua, you named your book Wholehearted Parenting. What does wholehearted parenting mean to you? So I'm going to tell you another story uh, about when my my uh, dad, my stepdad, actually, uh, but he was really uh, the person in my life who was who was in the role of dad. Um, when my stepdad died, um, I felt a lot of feelings. And one of the feelings that I felt was anger. And I remember now, Polina, I have been teaching about emotions you know, for at this, when he died, it, I'd been teaching about emotions for 15 years. I know about, you know, that all these emotions are part of grief, but still, uh, I, when I felt angry and I recognized that I felt angry, I told myself, oh, you shouldn't be angry. That was my first reaction. I'm like, no, shut up. <laughs> of course you should be. That's part of the experience. And it just, it just reminds me that, um, how often we are at war with ourselves, how often we are um, judging ourselves and one another and saying, don't feel what you're feeling. Don't be who you are. Be somebody different. And I think that... Uh, one of our deepest needs is for acceptance and belonging. And if I could give, you know, if I could give every child in the world one thing, it would be to feel that sense that they were, that they belonged. And how can we really feel accepted and whole? How can we feel that sense of, of, of being not perfect, but growing, perfect in our imperfection? How can we feel that when at the same time we're rejecting parts of ourselves and we're at war with ourselves? And I mean, you know 
from living where you live, how people become so polarized against each other. And, you know, when we say like go to war for a lot of us, it's a very abstract idea. And I know people who have actually lived through real war recognize that that word is, uh, is full of a lifetime of many lifetimes of pain and struggle. There's this idea that we're at war with ourselves. We're betraying ourselves. We're, we're rejecting ourselves. And if we do that, how can we, how can we really uh, embrace and connect with one another? So the idea of wholehearted, it means to say all of our hearts, all of our emotions, all of our experiences are part of who we are and that they're not some emotions that are bad and some emotions that are good, but that all of ourselves comes forward. And in this work of parenting, that when we can bring all of our heart forward, we can welcome and embrace all of our children. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges of of, of parenting, of all relationships, is how do we love people unconditionally? How do we love ourselves unconditionally? And at the very same time, be committed to growth. And to say to our kids, I love you exactly as you are. And I want to support you to grow and to be the best version of you. And I want to love myself. And I, 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 I wish it was, uh, I wish it was easier some days, but uh, to me, that's the harder part is loving myself. Um, it's really easy to see the things that I do wrong. And I think that as we think about, um, the, the way we really teach our kids, the biggest lesson we give our kids is through our own lifetime, our own experience, our own way of being. They see us. Annabelle Jensen, the president of Six Seconds, uh, likes to say, kids will remember 30% of what you say and 70% of what you do. Uh, she also says in a similar vein for teachers, you teach what you are. Who are you being? That's what you teach. And so I think this idea of being wholehearted, kind of a long answer, but this idea of being wholehearted is about being uh, okay with ourselves, being accepting all of these different experiences and parts of our lives and saying, I accept that, I'm at peace with that. And I'm going to keep growing. And that's what I'm going to teach my kids. Joshua is going to be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Accepting myself as a parent is one of the hardest things I'm doing in my life. I am... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing you said at the beginning, you will never be unafraid again. Yeah. Fear. Well, you know, how, how old are your kids now? <laughs> oh, uh, two of them are almost 10. And wow. um, the, the little one is almost four. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's fabulous. So you're right in the middle of all kinds of fun. <laughs> and, and we are all digital working and learning now. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I, I uh, became a parent, fear <laughs> entered my life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In such uh, a huge way. <laughs> so, yeah, I know what it means that I will never be unafraid. Again, this is this is the thing I cannot accept in myself, the way I'm afraid. Yeah. 
for them, uh, for uh, lo about losing them, about um, separating with them, but um, fatalistic separating with them, not them being in the other room or going to school or something like that. Uh, I'm afraid that every next meeting with them is going to be my last one. <laughs> and this is really the hardest thing I want to overcome in my life. And I, I will always remember uh, talking to you about my fears because you were looking at my profile <laughs> and uh, you told me that I'm, I'm, I'm blocked. A lot of things are blocking me. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really afraid of losing my families. And you said, someone who is frightened is someone who loves a lot. I will never forget that. And I said, of course, I'm afraid of losing the, the ones that I love. Why am I so ashamed of being so afraid? Mm. You made me think that there is nothing shameful for being afraid for your yeah. children and for um, expressing that fear. Of course, I'm searching the healthy ways of expressing it but yeah you told me you're a person who loves a lot and a person who fears a lot and that's very normal and uh fear is part of love you told me and um what does love do best it hugs you you don't need to overcome your fear you need to hug it. Mm. That's what you told me. <laughs> and I'm keeping it in my heart. Well, I think one of the one of the challenges that I have set for myself is to make friends with my own feelings. And, you know, I have I've had friends in my life. You know, some friends are really easy to be with. And it's like, oh, it's really fun to see them. But some friends are challenging. You know, some friends are like, come on, let's climb this mountain. Like, oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> okay, yeah. I guess we're going to go hiking. Like, <laughs> you know, and some friends are like, let's talk about this hard topic. Mm. Right. And um, you can still be good friends. Yeah. And I think that the that lesson for me that I can have a different kind of relationship with different emotions and I can still be friends. I can still say, okay, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to respect you. I'm going to value you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to care about you. You're not in charge of me. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> as our kids sometimes might say, you know, my fear is not in charge of me. And I can still respect and value and even honor and even love that feeling. And I think if we think about it this way, that like when our feelings are small and quiet, it's because we're not very engaged. <laughs> right. And so, you know, it's like when you're sitting on vacation by the pool and you're like, oh, I'm relaxed. It's, like yeah. fun. it's lovely. I mean, it's yeah. a really nice experience. But there's no passion. There's no drive. There's no energy. There's no commitment. Um, it's a passive state. You can have a nap. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And sometimes we need that, especially as parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, who wants to live your life like that? Right? Who wants to live your life in, you know, a constant state of nap? Mm. So I think that this, this idea that feelings are a signal of life. They're a signal of being awake. They're a signal of participating. And so if, if you as a parent, you're like, oh, I don't really have any feelings about my relationship with my kids. I don't really have any feelings about parenting. To me, that would be heartbreaking. Yeah. 
that you know having lots of feelings even when they're really hard to deal with and complicated like okay you're alive in this experience you know my my uh big son Krum, uh didn't sleep until he turned three and a half there was not a single night that he was asleep uh, I, I don't know how he managed <laughs> until three and a half. I, I consulted many doctors and they all said I'm overacting, <laughs> exaggerating, <laughs> but, but he didn't sleep. He, he actually didn't sleep. And um, he begin, began to sleep. Uh, he turned five and six and my husband uh, got me a present a pajamas and <laughs> <laughs> because i i still have problems with my sleeping uh the, the, it's been 10 years already since i gave birth to him but i still can't sleep <laughs> and um it's such a trauma <laughs> in my life <laughs> and he got me this present the pajamas with a note for the mother of Krum, and i opened it and there was uh, a writing on it with a dyslexia signs on it <laughs> uh, saying, never sleep. <laughs> and it was funny, but it was true. <laughs> yeah, I I'm using it. <laughs> never sleep. <laughs> Hopefully some naps. <laughs> From time to time, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of those stories too. But I actually faint somewhere on the coach, and Krum <laughs> thinks I'm I'm obviously dead because he never sees me sleep. <laughs> yeah, funny stories. Uh, you you talked about growing uh, before, and I remembered a part of your book when you were saying that parenting is letting your child grow. Mm. And um, I, I was thinking, what, what are your observations? How does a parent hinder this process of growing of their child? What can a parent actually do to avoid this? Mm. Yeah. Well, I was just with my brother. Um, and his, uh, he has two kids. His younger daughter is four, and she's um, really um, active. And um, she has a, a scooter where, like, it's you know, a like a skateboard with a handle, you know. And she's like going along, and we're going down a hill, and she's just like, boom. <laughs> and and he's like telling her, you know, use the brake, slow down, slow down, and. Um, and he said to me, gee, I wonder if she was a boy, would I do the same thing? And I said, well, I hope so. I mean, she's going really fast. <laughs> like, like uh, you know, if she falls, she's really going to hurt herself. I think this is a metaphor of uh, how fast do you want this child to go? You know, and I remember when my son was that age, uh, saying, I wish he would have a little bit more fear. You know, he's like too unafraid. <laughs> and now I see you like, yes. <laughs> um, and now he's 20 and there's, you know, times when I feel like I wish he had less fear. Um, it's so interesting how, like what like what he, what he is afraid of, what he used to be afraid of, how that's changed. Um, but are we teaching our children to be afraid of falling? Are we teaching them to be afraid of learning? Are we teaching them to be afraid of living? Are we, is our own fear in that moment, the kid is going down the hill really fast. Um, and our fear is legitimate and it's there for a reason. And I don't want to say, yeah, just push that fear away because that's a bad idea. And how do we express it? How do we share it? What are we teaching our child? 
about the world and the opportunities and the risks and their own strengths. So if you think every day, every interaction, every moment, you're teaching your child something, what do you want to be teaching them? And I think that the, I think that there's a piece about our job as parents is to see them growing, to see them learning, to witness it, and to help them see it. And to be able to say, wow, you know what? A year ago, you weren't able to do this. And look, you can do it now. Yeah. Right? I was talking to my older niece, uh, who's about to be 11. And I was, we were on this same trip uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we were going for a walk. And I said to her, it's really interesting to think just a couple of years ago, how you were afraid about X, Y, Z, and now you're not. Like that's, that's a lot of growth you've had. Right? And when you're, you know, when you're a kid, you can see yourself growing on the outside. How do you see yourself growing on the inside? And I think as parents, part of our, our opportunity, our job, is to be witnesses of that growth and allies of that growth, supporters of that growth, and to, to help them see, wow, I am becoming a, a better person. I'm becoming a stronger person. I'm becoming a more caring person. Yeah, exactly. Oh, very beautifully said, <laughs> really. <laughs> So I wanted to share, you mentioned the state of the heart, and I just wanted to share a couple of things from okay. the state of the heart research. Uh, let me give you a right to do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a study, oh. um, as I mentioned, of uh, people all over the world. Um, and we look at things, outcomes like these, being more effective, having stronger relationships, mental and physical health, and overall quality of life. And we know that this is now from 129 countries in the last few years, we can see that emotional intelligence scores are correlated with those success factors. In other words, the kind of line moves up towards the right. As emotional intelligence increases, these outcomes increase. Um, overall in the world, emotional intelligence went down a lot in the pandemic. 2019 to 2020, you can see it was going down, 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 down. And then it started to go up. <laughs> like, and then COVID. <laughs> and then COVID. Yeah. Um, but overall levels are back to like 2014. So uh, there's a lot to explore here. Uh, but just two points I want to make. One is, as we look at the EQ competencies, so we're back at the 2014 level in overall EQ. But in certain competencies, we see a lot of change. And this one is about seeing more risks. And we were talking about fear. Seeing more things, we're saying there's a danger, there's a problem, there's something wrong. And I think we've become, as a world, and remember this is 129 countries, as a world, we become more aware of these risks. And that's not all bad, but it's out of balance. And then navigate emotions is about being able to connect with and use our emotions. And we become much less able to do that. So in other words, our awareness of the risks have gone way up, but our ability to work with those emotions has gone down. Mm. And that's true of all ages, but it's especially true of the youngest people. This is my case too. And this is what I wanted to just look at in terms of, of younger people. Uh, the youngest generation in this sample is Gen Z. Um, so basically under 25 years old. Uh, their ability to collaborate has gone down a lot in the last year. Their feeling of community, their feeling of connectedness. And remember, Paulina, earlier I said, if I could give peep kids one thing, it would be that feeling of connection. Yeah. And they feel isolated. They feel alone. This, 
So just to put this in perspective, in one year, for to have this much change, we've been doing this study for a decade. I have never seen anything like this. And this one year, this 15% drop is so big. And so we have this moment when young people, like all of us, are feeling more anxious. And young people, it's dramatic. Yeah. All of us feel that disconnection of, oh, I wish we could hug people again. But for young people, that is an intense pain. So what that means to me is that as parents and educators and just as people who are concerned about the future, uh, we, can't, we can't just keep going as normal. We have to do things differently. And I know some people are like, oh, well, well, the pandemic will end and it'll just be back to normal. And I think that's um, a really nice illusion or delusion. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it would be if we could just go, oh, yeah, it's going to be back to normal. But first of all, I don't know that normal was that great in the past. Um, but we're not going back there. Yeah, and absolutely. We have a lot of research about trauma and about emotional struggle, which says it doesn't just go away. So we have work to do. And, you know, I know you're hearing this going, oh, I'm already working hard. What do I do now? What do I do more? But we have more work to do. We have yeah. to do it. Our kids need it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I've been thinking about that a lot, about this uh, Gen Z and how they are actually living this reality now and they have no other reality. And what are they going back to? Mm. Yeah. What exactly? And how is actually their future uh, going to be influenced by the way they are growing up now yeah i mean for your kids especially the the older ones when you're you think about i mean i remember when i was 10 years old you know and star wars came out and like, I, like there's certain things you remember your whole life yeah. Yeah. um they're gonna remember these years their whole lives they're gonna remember what their experience was like they're gonna remember how their parents reacted. Mm -hmm. They're going to remember whether they felt supported or not. And, you know, in their whole lives, this will be part of their story of how do we deal with challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always talking to my children that uh, these are times of change now we are going through. And, uh, are really historical times. And um, we're talking a lot. I'm, um, me and my husband, actually, we are talking together always. We are explaining that they are going to tell their kids lots of things that probably will never happen again because it's, it's something really rare <laughs> to happen exactly that what happens now. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, probably reducing their anxiety about all of this now. But um, I'm really worried, really worried of the is isolation they're experiencing. I'm really yeah. worried how is this going to influence uh, all of their future relationships? How are, how are they going to connect with people? Um, so... Yeah. There's, there's, there's some, it's a very, it's very complicated. We're doing this massive experiment on ourselves yeah. in the world. And it's, we've never seen this. Yeah. There have been pandemics before, but this context we've never seen. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting to me talking to my older kid about digital technology yeah. and, um, one thing that's interesting is both of my kids kind of reject 
the phone. They like going out and hiking. Sometimes I'm like, where, like sending the messages, where are you? And I don't get a reply and my, I start getting afraid. And then like a day later, oh, I didn't have my phone on, <laughs> which is very unusual for, you know, 20 and 22 year old. But um, so on the one hand, that they're kind of rejecting the technology. But the other hand, um, my older kid, M says, like for them, relationships are real mm -hmm. on text. And actually they say, they feel like they have more authentic communication by text than in person. That their that their texts, their friends that they communicate with on text, they're really honest with each other. There's a level of openness that they don't have when they're when they're talking together. And I thought that was so like so different than my experience, it's like the opposite for me. It is. But I think it's possible. Uh, I don't think we can put away. I don't think we're going to get rid of this technology. And I don't think we're going to get rid of, you know, this battle about screens. And um, I do think it's possible for us to help our kids have uh, really authentic communication, even if it's on the phone, even if it's on text. Uh, I do think that the, the, there's an abundant body of research that says uh, social media is a, a big risk for kids and that it reduces their emotional health when they use it too much. Too much, yeah. And I think this is especially for girls. Mm -hmm. um, it's like we take our sense of self and put it outside onto the phone. And that's a risk. And yeah, it's not going away. And so the question is, how do we engage with our kids to say like, okay, what are some different ways we can use this technology? Yeah, exactly. Like this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or uh, like denying what they find interesting on television, uh, on the movies, uh, on, on <clears throat> games, digital games they have. You know, I've watched with my children, um, Arcane, did you? <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. you have to, because as I thought that Inside Out was a beautiful movie, mm. talking about emotions, Arcane is mm. much, much better. Mm. Much, okay, much I'm excited. Yeah, you have to. And I know about Arcane because my children are fond on the game League of Legends. Oh, yes. And my husband ta taught me that if I'm denying what they find interesting, uh, I will lose them. I will lose th those children, probably. Do they, do they play Minecraft? Is that popular still? Yeah, but... Not too much. Not so much. Uh, because I forbid it. <laughs> 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 but I, 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 I forbid it not too much as well. Yeah. <laughs> I so, allow it from time to time. <laughs> so I am forever grateful to Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, my son has uh, some learning differences and he wasn't able to like his writing he couldn't read his writing it was really difficult um the specialist who was helping him we said well what about typing and she said i don't think he'll even be able to type because it's just not how his brain works he started playing minecraft and he became really motivated to type oh he was able, he was he learned to type because of minecraft so and that's amazing yeah and um there was a lot of big emotions. Yeah. You know, somebody messed up my house and um and my my wife's reaction was like, you shouldn't play this. <laughs> it's too violent. It's too, you know, whatever. And my reaction was would you teach me how to play? Yeah. And we and we ended up like 
playing together. And it was very interesting because he was and is much better at video games than me. And so um, it became a place where he could be the expert. And, um, but it, it, it created a space for a conversation. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, again, if we can engage with our kids, as you said, like, this is what they're interested. Can we engage with them in what they're interested in? Yeah. With limits. <laughs> with with <some> limits. Boundaries. <laughs> with limits, of course. But it's important that you, uh, as a parent, are part of what's interesting for your child. And yeah, it opens topics of discussion. And that's exactly yeah. what my husband will do. He, uh, these are the exact words. Can you can you can you show me what's so interesting? I can show you what's interesting for me, and they're exchanging experience. And uh, they uh, introduced to me this um, this movie Arcane, which is part of the League of Legends game. Every of the personalities there has actually a story. And mm. it's amazing. It's all built on a story. Yeah. And every one of the personalities are connected to their childhood. And what could it be if their childhood was different? Because they are orphans. Mm. All of the personalities mm. there are orphans. Mm. It's a beautiful movie. You have to, you have to watch it. Thank you. I it's will. really connected to emotional intelligence and building those relationships and uh, taking uh, decisions. <laughs> it's it's amazing, amazing. Okay, okay. I, I have a quote here, uh, and I want to ask you a question about it. Uh, it's Dr. Shefali Tabari. I hope I pronounce it okay. Uh, nothing hurts the parental heart more than to see our children in pain. But guess what? Nothing hurts our children more than to have a parent who is unable to witness their pain. Hmm. What do you think of this thought? Is it, is it possible for a parent not to be so vulnerable? <laughs> uh so yeah of course it's possible um we can shut off our emotions and we can pretend not to feel but i don't think that's what the quote is saying i don't think the quote is saying don't feel uh i think the quote is saying um feel be there even though it's hard be there especially when it's hard and I, I remember when um, one of my kids was struggling with some mental health issues and feeling a lot of fear and anxiety. And as somebody who works with emotions, I'm like, I, you know, I really want to I really want to teach them. And um, that wasn't my job. With teenagers, um, it's a very I think our, our relationship changes a lot. If we want to be allies to our kids, we have to really stay in that role. I'm here as your ally. I'm here as a coach, not mm. as a teacher. I'm here as a, a supporter, not as a critic. Mm. Um, but I remember one time being with, with one of my kids and they're just, they're sitting there crying and crying and crying. And I just remember thinking, I'm not going to try to fix this. I'm not going to try to change this. I'm just going to sit here and be with them. I mm. want them to know I'm with them. And uh, that was hard. I remember uh, as a teenager, my older kid saying to us one time, um, you overreact when I tell you things and that makes me not want to tell you things. So I'm going to tell you this, but don't overreact. <laughs> like oh okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't try to fix this for me don't try to save me don't try to take away my feelings don't try to take away my power let me 
own this, mm -hmm. but stand with me. Right, and I think that's um, as our kids get older. So I know we're running out of time. One of the things that I, I would like to just ask everyone to think about, I think a lot of times as parents, we sort of think about the next week, <laughs> the next day, you know, maybe, you know, the next couple of years, maybe we start thinking about, okay, where, you know, when they're going to go to college, where are they going to go to college? I would really encourage all of us as parents to think about um, what kind of parent is this kid going to be? Mm. What kind of grandparent is this kid going to be? You know, as you look at your 10 year olds and you say, well, if they have, you know, if when they're 50, who are they going to be? Because I think if we take that longer perspective about our own kids and we say, what do I really want to contribute to this child? What do I want them, you know, in 40 years from now, they're talking to family members and saying, gosh, I remember back in the winter of 2021, I remember when it just, we were in that stage of the pandemic and I remember you know, I don't remember what my mom said, but I remember how she supported us. I remember how it felt in our house. You know, and what is it you want them to remember? And I think that perspective really shifts us away from the day-to-day -day kind of noise of our job as parents uh, and into what's really at the heart of who we want to be, who we want our kids to be, what do we want family to mean, what we want it to mean to them to be a parent, what, you know, what we're teaching in the way we relate to one another and the way we're showing up. Those are the big gifts we can give them. And I think we can give ourselves the gift of being able to step back and think about what's really important here. Yeah, absolutely. What do I want them to remember? Powerful, really powerful. Definitely, I don't want them to remember me how scared I was. <laughs> well, I mean, Paulina, maybe, maybe what they can remember is how scared you were and how courageous you were even though you were scared oh. it's not you know courage isn't the absence of fear probably 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 they see me their way because you know when you say uh how courageous you are i remember them uh being six years old and uh i'm pregnant with uh alan the little one and they are drawing a picture of me. I am some kind of a superhero, but a woman. I'm not superwoman. I'm not a cat woman. I'm 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 something much bigger than Batman, Superman, Hulk, <laughs> and everything combined in one. Uh, much stronger thing. And it says, "Mom." <laughs> 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 yeah, and I was so thrilled <laughs> to see this. I cried all night. I had them, the hormones and etc. you know. <laughs> but yeah, they drew me as a superhero. They obviously saw me like a superhero. I still cannot understand why, but probably mm. someday I will ask them. <laughs> Probably someday uh, yeah, do they it will before, do it before they turn into teenagers. But yeah. <laughs> I do have um, one other thought I wanted to share about about that, which is, you know, our relationship with our kids and with ourselves and with our partners and families changes over time. And one of the things I'm really grateful about right now, as I think about, you know, my older kid being on an airplane right now, yeah. my younger kid being climbing a mountain right now. He, he's somewhere, he's somewhere uh, rock climbing, just talking about fear as a parent. But um, I like them. 
I like who they are. Mm-hmm. And I'm enjoying uh, getting to know them as adults. And the middle period, you know, from like 14 to 19 is very, very difficult. And um, I think a, for a lot of parents of teenagers, it, it just it feels impossible. Um, so I'm feeling that sense of hope now of like, it's not easy with young adults either, but I'm feeling this sense of, of hope of like, okay, we're entering this new phase. And so for parents who are in the middle of the teenage struggles, I, I want you to know that it does get better. Uh, there is another side. Is, is this the biggest challenge you had? being a parent to separate from your children? The biggest challenge uh, was to, as I said, move into that role of ally Mm. and actually learning to be a coach and doing coach training really helped me as a parent because it helped give me a kind of structure to say, okay, how do I, how do I stand next to this person? Um, and that was that was very very there were some very difficult days and weeks and years uh with teenagers Hmm. but it also was a time of a lot of growth for me yeah so maybe that's the ending point is that you know for us as parents to be growing and for our kids to see us growing and learning i mean of all the things we could teach them, what if we could teach them to keep growing and learning? I love that. I, I love the idea of letting our children see us growing as parents. Uh, I, I love it. Really well, love please. it. Thank you for oh, Joshua, me. I, I, I have one more question. Can I ask it? Yeah. Uh, you're talking in your book about magic tricks <laughs> um, of a parent to recharge and to bring back your motivation, power, and meaning again. <laughs> Can you share some of these magic tricks? Can they actually be magic tricks? Well, I don't think there's any magic, but <laughs> um, I think that... <clears throat> um, when we are drained you know and parenting it's it can be really exhausting and when we're drained we don't do as good a job and i think it's important for us to pay attention to what recharges us what makes us feel alive and creative what's fun for us as parents what's meaningful for us as parents and to recognize that nourishing ourselves is part of nourishing our children and i think you know some people go too far one way or the other like you know self-sacrificing on one side or self-indulgent on the other and i think we need to kind of find that middle place where like when we find ourselves kind of moving too far into self-sacrifice to say okay wait a minute it's time to balance again we find ourselves being too selfish to go, okay, let me pay attention to other people a little bit more. Um, I think that the, um, when you are enjoying being a parent, when you can find those places, like, you know, you and one kid go out and go for a walk and, you know, float a paper boat in the lake and, you know, enjoy seeing dragons in the in the clouds and you know (laughs) like those moments are nourishing for us and nourishing for our family relationship and so i would say this is a gift we can give our kids is uh, recharging regenerating ourselves and you know with the pandemic i i sort of a few months ago i felt like i was an old cell phone You know how when your cell phone is getting older, you plug it in 
and it's 100% charge. And then you go out and one hour later, it's 50%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt. And so I realized, okay, <laughs> I need to do some things differently. I need to start doing some things that recharge me. And, you know, for me, that was going to acupuncture and getting an electric bicycle and um, just changing my schedule. But whatever it is for you, I think putting yourself into the condition, you know that every day as a parent, you know that you have you know, 18 hours you are on. And so uh, like preparing yourself for that level of engagement is important. And Absolutely. making sure you have some time <laughs> for yourself. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> we are trying to have yeah. this time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love part of your book when, when uh, you are preparing candles for you and Patty. And uh, <laughs> you're actually sick and there is a flood. And yeah, uh, you know, people... <laughs> His book is in Amazon, right? You can order it from there and uh, it's available <laughs> and it's amazing. You, oh, you, can, you. you can learn a lot from it and um, you, can, you can touch Joshua's heart in every word. Thank you, Paulina. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for all of your work sharing emotional intelligence in Bulgaria and beyond. And I'm really excited about what we get to do uh, now and next year and continuing this work. Thank you for, for supporting us. Because, you know, um, you were the first organization and it was abroad uh, that actually supported Fantasia's work. And uh, we are still working, collaborating, and it's growing big. <laughs> and it's amazing, really amazing what you are doing for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs> a... Oh, no, uh, let me share a screen with your contacts, if okay. you don't mind, for the people here. Um, yeah. Why can I? Of course, here, but also Joshua uh, has a web page in Wikipedia, so you can see information about him there too. And we have several posts on Fantasia before our webinar sharing lots of information about Joshua. So just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Joshua, have a great day and wonderful meeting with your children. <laughs> Thank you. Hug them a lot. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye. <laughs>